Hello everyone. Welcome to this, the second of the Westpeer Trust's online or virtual talks. Um, the Westpeer Trust had held a successful series of, uh, of uh, talks, monthly talks in the Westpeer Centre and of course current circumstances have meant that we can't continue with those. And so the virtual online talks uh, are a way um, out of the issue. Um, this time round, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Faye Davis to talk about the Westpeer Trust Kiosk Restoration Project. The Westpeer Trust's kiosk is absolutely crucial in terms of preserving what, one of the most important surviving pleasure peer buildings in, in Britain and, and the world. I should say about Faye, and Faye has worked with the Westpeer Trust for a um, a good, uh, a fair number of years now. Faye is the is the heritage director of Burrell Foley Fisher Architects. Um, Faye is an RIB accredited specialist conservation architect with 20 years experience in the adaptation and restoration of listed buildings. Uh, so Faye has vast experience and she spends a fair amount of time over the last few years peering at um, rusty iron which we've kept in storage uh, which form the major part of of one of the West Pier kiosks and Faye is going to tell us about the history of the kiosk and and its architect it's in, and talk about its importance and talk a bit about the restoration challenges of putting together a building that was made in the mid 1860s um, and has been on the seafront in Brighton for a good good part of the time since then. So welcome Faye. Um, thank you Fred, th thank you. And it's great, it's great that you're here, thank you so much. Um, could you talk about the history of the kiosk and why it's important please? Yeah sure, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about uh, Eugenius Birch, the uh, Brighton West Pier and particularly the kiosk. Um, it's a really exciting project, not only for um, the West Pier Trust, but also for Brighton and its seafront. So I just wanted to start with um, telling you a little bit about the architect or uh, actually the civil engineer um, for Brighton West Pier kiosk. So um, Eugenius Birch, he was born in 1818 and he was a 19th century English naval architect and civil engineer. And without a doubt, Eugenius Birch he was one of the most important and um, peer builders of, it, of the time. No other engineer matched Eugenius Birch's output. In fact, he dominated the design and construction of peers throughout his lifetime. He um, constructed um, no fewer than 14 peers throughout the country or throughout the uh, UK. And um, what's interesting is that um, he, there is no biographies or books dedicated to him. He's a bit of an enigma. Unlike uh, Brunel, there is no photographs. No one knows what he looked like. But he did have such an interesting career, um, in particular in relation to pier design. Um, so what's unique about the Brighton West Pier and um, the kiosk itself is that um, it's a grade one listed structure. It's classed as one of uh, Eugene Spurge's finest piers. And it was opened in 1866, and it was the contractor was R. Laidlaw and Son from Glasgow. What's interesting, particularly about this, is that by the time we got to 1866, Eugenius Birch had perfected um, the construction of screw piles with cast iron and wrought iron columns with wrought iron bracing. Now, um, you probably all know about um, Victorian times and the construction of um, piers throughout the country, but they were classed um, as, um, so people could take the sea air. And Brighton at the time was becoming more and more of a, a holiday destination. Um, for instance, in this um, quote, um, Brighton is becoming more and more resemblance of a tropical, tropical tree, which, is, which knows no season, which fr flourishes and bears bud and blossom and ripe fruit together in clustering magnificence at the same in January as in June. So this was a place where people would want to come and visit. And that's why it, in one of the drawers was Brighton West Pier. Um, in relation um, to the, the design and style of West Pier, it, was, it resembled the Far Eastern style, which was similar to the Brighton Pavilion. 
and it was deemed to be more modern and spacious than any other pier of its time. At the time, Brighton had another pier, which was the Chain Pier, and this uh, kind of blew, blew at the Chain Pier out the water. Um, what's interesting particularly about this is that it's one of the first piers to have um, purpose-built buildings specially designed for a pleasure pier. Um, what I'll do is just quickly share you some images while I carry on talking. Uh, if I just get, you can see this. So you see, um, there's some original design drawings um, on the top of the screen. Um, other than the entrance tour booths and the ornamental gates, the pier structure consisted of two octagonal. Um, kiosks with minarets in the center and four more if I quickly go back to this and four more if I mark it up as I go along there was two um octag octagonal kiosks here and then there was four more further down the pier itself now um these were, um, these were simple structures, were more or less a kit of ornate iron parts forming a frame with infill timber panels. The glazed weather screens were seen as a novel idea and could provide protection from the elements without interrupting the view. So, um, and like Blackpool North Pier, which was another one of his piers, um, there's a continuous broad comfort seating with high end curved backs along the length of the promenade which could seat up to 3,000 to 4,000 people. And below deck, there was a pier head with landing stages for pleasure steamers and to land at high tide. At the time, the structure was seen to be the most elegant and light, light structure of its time. Everyone must admire the lightness of the appearance. No one should doubt the lightness com combined with solidarity. So it was a really important piece of pier history, but also a buildings and buildings of this type within its time and that's why the kiosk is so unique and um, so that kind of gives you a bit of a background in terms of where it sat and what it kind of looked like at the time and um, in, the, in the top right hand corner you can see that's there was there was a massive parade when the building when the pier first opened and um, and you can see on this page itself how it's sort of dilapidated and deteriorated throughout time. Um, so that, that's it in terms of where we sit within the kiosk and where it sits within the, the, the West Pier and how it sits within history as well. Fred, so, um, so, so thank you, Faye. That's um, really fascinating. Um, and you said, I think, that the pier, that the kiosk uh, and the other pier buildings was made elsewhere and prefabricated and then erected on on the pier as the pier was being built. Can you say any more about that and um, and anything about the firm that uh, made made the kiosk and, and the rest of the pier? Yeah, so um, so pier design was not only a feat of engineering, but it was also an art form. And Birchard time pushed the boundaries. And you know, I mentioned a quote there about how elegant and um, it, these were sort of the finest um, corkscrew and slender piers. What's interesting is that over time, uh, the design of the pier was actually um, came, Birch's design came into question because the structure in 1868, um, the structure itself vibrated so much um, that the people pushed, rushed off the pier in panic um, because it was so, it was so fine and detailed and he was pushing the boundaries of, of engineering that um, it didn't have as much rigidity as he hoped uh, and the, and he over designed um, the structure which didn't allow for the deflection um, it was almost a bit of the first um, uh, wobbly bridge you know um, the bridge what went across the Thames the Millennium mm. Bridge which had that wobble this, this is kind of the same thing if people walked across it it, it had the same momentum so um, at the time uh, the foundations and columns um, had to be checked and obviously everyone was questioning his design um, but what was unique about it is that he'd obviously struck up a, a understanding with the, the cast iron firm which was based out of Glasgow and um, the, the, 
the parts of the pier had to come down on a boat from Glasgow to Shoreham on Sea. Um, and it had a hiccup. The early start of the building of this project um, had a hiccup because the seas were rough and it, it took a while to get the, the, the parts which were made down to Shoreham. And then obviously from Shoreham, they had to be taken off and put on a train to be then taken to um, Brighton. Um, so the construction itself, um, it's, it's not really complicated. Obviously he perfected this design throughout the, throughout the years doing all these um, piers. It's basically, it's a kit of parts. Um, and um, the first portion, the decks, uh, the, it increased and developed over time. So um, there was a mixture of cast iron and raw iron. Um, and the screw pile foundations were cast, um, cast iron sockets connected to raw iron strips of columns. And, and, and that's just the pier itself. But then, then the, the kiosk and having looked at the pieces and um, the components of the kiosk itself, it was basically like a big kit of um, Meccano. Things slotted in, it was really carefully thought about. And you can tell from other pier design that people copied his, um, his mechanics and how he basically slotted things in together and tied it all together. And it was quite simple and, and, and looking at the history of how it was constructed has kind of helped us develop going forwards of, of how to put it back together. So that's now it that, in terms of, yeah. That's, oh, that's fascinating. Now I was going to ask you how, how the kiosk and indeed the pier, but especially the kiosk changed over time. And one of the great advantages of cast iron is that you can duplicate it, that uh, once you've got a design for one kiosk, you could in theory build a hundred kiosks from, from the same, same casts. Um, but it's also the case that cast iron doesn't, um, doesn't like pressure and, or being hit in various sorts of ways. Um, some time ago, you told me that one of the issues for the kiosk was that gravity got to work on the kiosks. And basically, right. I guess, was it the weight of the kiosk? Just, yeah. And gravity so, pulled the kiosk down right. and apart. So, so having gone through all the components, there's actually only 20 different components for a eight meter by eight meter structure. Um, so when you think about it, there's, there's not that many pieces. Um, Obviously, there's this, the odd um, final fin um, finial bits which were stuck onto the timber. But the main part of the structure was this ring beam. And I'll quickly show you some images of the cast iron itself, and then people will be able to understand. So um, what we did originally is that we labelled all the parts. We checked what was still available and whether or not when I was first brought on board, we didn't even know if we had a one complete kiosk. So what we had to do is we had to check what pieces were still surviving and then work out how it's put together. So the main problem, obviously, um, if you know about gravity and, and the size of structure, um, there's, a, there's a big weight on top of the, um, um, this minaret at the top. This is all cast iron. So, um, can you see that? Yes, yeah. that's good, yeah. So um, there's a big ring beam. So I was just trying to find my annotate button, brilliant. So we've got a big um, minaret at the top. This is all cast iron, so it's really heavy. And then all these, this balustrade, it's also cast iron. And then and we've got cast iron here, and then we've got this ring beam, which runs a around the full octagonal structure. Now that's the thing which has failed. So the weight of the um, minaret and the cast iron um, balustrade is kind of pushing down and spreading out the roof. So what's happening is the structure was doing this. So if I just quickly show you a picture from, I think it's 1990s or 1980s, if I just quickly get it up. Um, you can see this is how the, before the, kiosk was dismantled you can see that there is this um there is this strap which is here which runs around the whole of the the building and that's kind of trying to stop the spread of the cast iron um falling out the way 
And that's the thing what's failed. Um, cast iron works really well in compression, but not in tension. So um, the, the, un fundamentally, it, it was an uh, inherent design flaw of all the structures on the, on the, um, the kiosks. Um, but now we know what the problems are. That's how we can develop that and work out how to prevent that going forwards. Right. What, that, that last photograph you showed, Faye, yeah. was also brilliant in illustrating some of the ornamental uh, or Far Eastern detail on the, on the, on the, especially the brackets and some of the columns yeah. as well. Yeah. And that's, I think that's something which helped the, um, helped the pier stand out as being very special when, when it was first built. It's the first time I think where a pier has that amount of detail on it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not just a, uh, it's not just classed as a, a you know, a windbreak. It's actually gone to town and enjoyed doing the detailing, and you can see that from the from the dew, these hanging dew drops. And you think they look small there; they're actually really heavy. They're, they're they're about that big these dew drops. And then, obviously, it's gone into the detail with filigree um, on the uh, cantilevered brackets. And then he's he's carried on with the dew drops within um, the infill panels, and then the column heads. Here you can't tell because the quite rusty and they've been painted over but the detail is magnificent and it goes right down to the the column bases as well and um, and what's interesting about the cast iron is that it is classed as structural but also the timber screens are quite important as well and they've changed throughout time as well so, so for instance on this photograph you can see there's four openings um, in a doorway and then if i try and quickly show you another photograph um, you can see that there's all sorts of different configurations and how they've changed throughout time so it's adapted the, this it's not you know the cast iron's still there but the screens we don't have the original screens left so right so um, absolutely fascinating then with this outstanding building and um, time and gravity, um, I suppose initial design weaknesses which weren't really thought about or couldn't be thought about all bring about some change. And then as you say, the buildings change as well. Some of the buildings change in their use and they become multi-purpose buildings. Some become shops, um, some become places for shows. Yeah. And they go on from 1866 all the way through um, into the 1960s. Um, and by the 1960s, after the first initial boom of the post-war years, the West Pier and many other piers were really starting to suffer in terms of falling visitor numbers, in terms of uh, the increasing cost of, of repair and maintenance. Um, and... Um, the West Pier itself, half of it, the southern half was closed in, I think it was eight, um, 1969, and the rest of the pier was closed in 1975. Yeah, and it didn't help throughout time as well, that the, in as early as 1952, um, the theatre, which was built at the end by actually uh, Eugenius Birch's nephew, um, it suffered fire damage and Obviously, because of that, no visitor numbers started to dwindle. And it's what's interesting is also, I started when package holidays started. So people were starting to go abroad. They weren't having as many holidays within the UK. So it just, it just didn't, didn't become a draw to, to go to a pier and walk down it. It's, you know, people's tastes and time changed, which is sad because it, it, was, it was the slow, painful um, demise of the, the West Pier. And even though in... Um, October 1969, English Heritage at the time um, wanted to uh, list the building. Um, they did, um, the owner did consent to, uh, or they did seek to get the um, theatre demolished, um, but it was considered too expensive because um, it was considered too expensive to maintain. Um, I think that's what came about it being listed as well. So even though that the pier, how the pier stands today, this is another fact which I found out doing the uh, kiosk restoration, is that even though the pier is in the state it is, a shell, 
um, it's still grade one listed. It hasn't been delisted. So technically all the kiosk material, which we've got in storage is grade one listed. And it's the only grade one listed structure uh, left within the country. So that's why it's significant. That's why the, that's why the kiosk is significant. Mm. Okay, so um, when did you first start to look at the kiosk and work on the kiosk, Faye? Um, so I did a I did a thesis on Eugenius Birch, and I started looking at uh, some of his peer buildings. Um, and then I think um, before that, um, my colleague John Burrell had done some work for Brighton West Pier when we were trying to um, save the entire pier before it, it burnt down. Um, so it was probably oh, 2000 and might have been 2012. Um, I started looking at the pier structure. Um, and the first thing what we had to do originally, it was stored in some um, storage containers and some of it was outside. So what we did is we um, we discussed it as a client body and moved the, the structure into inside to prevent any further deterioration and damage. That was the first thing we did. Um, and obviously fundraising throughout the, the years continued um, and we catalogued every single component, which I'll quickly show you. Um, where is it? So um, we catalogued every component. We'd had these um, CAD drawings from when we were hoping to reconstruct the whole pier. Um, so we checked every component, made sure we had enough. What was interesting, we have enough for one and a half kiosks. We don't have quite enough for two kiosks. Um, and then they were all of varying um, uh, decay there are all varying stages of decay but what's interesting is that you can still see um where the where the lugs are and where things um where items need to be bolted to the timber structures so if you can see here you can see there's two lug holes and there's some lug holes here and then there's also evidence that some of these columns were used for rainwater so obviously cast iron and rainwater especially salt water is not very good it deteriorates further um, and then, and then throughout the design process, that was the first thing we catalogued everything um, to make sure that we could fit everything in or see if there was all the components today. Um, and there's some interesting pieces. Um, and what's really good about what, what is really good and sad at the same time is that it's been re really well pho photographed throughout its whole, whole history, basically, and especially when it was when it was deemed to be an unsafe structure and Brighton West Pier um, Trust had to do something about it, they catalogued it and they photographed the dismantling of the pier and that dismantling actually has helped us work out how to reassemble it. So for instance, we even know where there's spandrel brackets and slots and how, how pieces slotted together. Um, if, we, if you see the photograph at the bottom of this uh, bracket, this is one of the pieces which were tested to see what would come out sandblasted. And once the years and years of paint have been taken off, you can still see the fine detail of the cast iron. And it's, it's beautiful. Um, so before we did that, um, if I go on to the next page, we did an analysis of what the paint would be and what, what color. What's interesting is there's not a lot of documentation in any journals or papers about what color these cast, what these structures of the sea were made out of, what, what colors there were. And like anything throughout time, colors and tastes changed. So originally, um, some of the schemes were painted white or full green, and then there was, a, there was um, some blue column, columns. Um, so there was a lot of different paint schemes. I think for the, for the kiosk itself, I think there was about eight or nine different paint colors. I was just going to try and find you the one which the final colour which we were kind of working on, which I don't have a copy of, I'm afraid. Um, but we were looking at the one of the original colour schemes to take it back to. And that was, was that um, a red and a cream? A cream, that is right, yeah. Yes. I thought, I thought there was going to be more colours picked out, um, but it, it wasn't. It was more of a simple palette, really. Mm. 
but it still conjures up this radically modern building, 1866, a terribly innovative, modern, unusual building. Nothing like it had really been seen before, although, mm. as you say, the Blackpool North Pier and so on, but nothing of the scale and the detail and the quality of that had been seen. Yeah. And then if you factor in the colours, it must have been an amazing sight to be walking along the prom in Brighton and to see in the distance uh, this... Yeah. Uh, cream and red cast iron structure um, yeah. being pushed out to sea um, and p people being able to promenade on it so an absolutely staggeringly unusual thing to do and of course nowadays peers are taken for granted but i think it's it's interesting to try and bear in mind what impact they had especially the most outstanding ones when they first appeared yeah, and it's the accumulation of that technology and the development of it, um, and what and how Birch introduced these elements to the West Pier, and that's what makes it really significant. And I presume this is why it's Grade One listed, is the yes. lightness of the structure which was achieved, the number of columns or the least number of columns, and um, none of them were raked; they were all straight, and it was one of the most elegant pier structures of its time. Um, it yes. was designed with mon mon monumentality in mind. That's one of the key um, phrases. It was architecturally ambitious and its scale surpassed any previous peer building. Mm. So that's, and, and, and that's why the kiosk and, the, and the, even the remnants of the peer today are really significant. Yes, I think it's interesting um, that, um, well, as we know, the peer had closed by 1975. But even so, there was a huge amount of support for the peer in Brighton and nationally. Uh, figures from, including John Betchman, for instance, were yes. massively in favour of the peer. There were local campaigns. There was a very vocal, we want the West Pier campaign. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that if that campaigning hadn't gone on for year after year, decade after decade, um, the, we wouldn't have the kiosk now, for example. Um, I think there are two, probably two peers in the country which led that seaside um, heritage movement or campaigns for two peers. One was the West Pier in Brighton and the other was Clevedon Pier in Somerset. And both at about the same time, uh, there were threats of um, demolition and destruction. And in both cases, national figures and local people came in to support those those structures and say these are important important buildings and so we i think it's worthwhile acknowledging just the value of 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 what people have done hundreds of people have done over um, years and decades to try to keep the west pier and elements of the west pier alive um of course looking at the ruin now we could say well that didn't work did it but actually i do think it worked it it's yeah. worked in some ways because we've got this priceless kiosk uh, this gem of a kiosk and i think the west pier ruin is probably the most photographed yes. um, structure in brighton so it's still very very significant i think and and it it is of its time and it, it sort of gives you it, element of, of a reminder of not how to let things deteriorate further um and i hope that people are aware of it but it is it's it's very fo it's photographed all the time it's one of these buildings which people and they love it and they love the ruin um, but what i think is interesting is trying to salvage the kiosk and get it back on the seafront and i think that's really important that people understand the history of the kiosk and 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 make it a space and a building which can be used for future generations for them to understand sea, the seaside um, and also um, Victorian architecture and um, make it a community space so people can appreciate it. Yeah. And that's, I guess, that's kind of what the brief and how the brief developed going forwards with the kiosk itself. It wasn't just, it's not just going to be a building which is um, almost a piece of history. It's got a patina to it we're not putting it back like it's brand new we want people to see where the boats go and how things have been constructed um and i think that's important for for education um 
and it's been fun trying to work out how to put it all back together <coughs> and and what what I'm looking forward to is is getting getting it on site and getting the funds raised so that we can do that. As you say, you 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 described it as a giant Meccano kit, and it's a sort of three-dimensional jigsaw, and it must have been a real puzzle to work out what went where. where. Um, but um, could you talk us through some of the challenges of restoring it? How much of it can we? How much of the cast iron can we use? And how how can we make sure that the structure, the kiosk, when it's rebuilt? is stable um yeah that's really interesting because we're going to slightly cheat so um hmm. i'm just going to try and find the right page in the report and um, because it's because the structure was probably um fabricated in the 1860s it's um very old um, and we don't know what the condition of is of the cast iron, can it support the exact weight of the of the the roof? Well, we know it had an inherent design fault anyway. So what we're going to have to do, and I'm just going to try and find the right the page in the report to be able to show you, is we're having to put a hidden structure within the thickness of the um, timber screens, and we're putting in a steel frame. So this is basically to make sure that the building stands up, basically. Um, just find the right pages uh, and this this frame is going to um, yeah sorry I'm finding the pages from the structural engineers report and I hope that John Orwell forgives me if he listens and I'm saying the right things and um, so you can see from his um, original sketch that the problem was with this ring being around the, um, the top of the uh, roof structure what we're trying to do is stabilize by putting in the new columns hidden within this, the timber frat, timber panels and putting in a new steel ring beam um, at two levels and bracing so that it's stopping the building pushing down and spreading and, and it's basically making sure that the load is going down in the right places and not putting stresses and strains on the historic fabric. So even though it's kind of cheating maybe slightly at the same time we're sort of or only rely on the cast iron to be able to withstand its own with, with withstand its own um weight and we're not putting any additional weight onto it so if i um find our proposals if i can find them uh, sorry i've got about a thousand emails uh drawings are open at the same time so you can see on here, um, we original cast iron, um, the cast iron you can see on the outside here, and what we're putting in is hidden pieces of timber within the thickness of the timber, uh, not timber, we're putting hidden bits of steel within the existing timber frames. So the, the, where the timber frames were, they didn't have insulation in. You can see the photograph on the, on the right here. It's basically just timber board on both sides and posts. So what we're doing is we're intending to put in additional insulation to make sure that it's a comfortable space for people. We go back to the the main plan. We can see that we're going to put in um, additional uh, timber bracing as well as uh, the steel uh, hidden within the framing. And we're also looking at the design of the, the internal space as well. So there isn't a lot of documentation about what the original uh, kiosks were other than a place for shelter so we're presuming that they would have had seats at some point um, so this space is going to be used for multi-use flexible space for the community and for talks for um, Brighton uh, West Pier Trust um, and if we can go on to the next one if I go to here you can see um, sort of a sketch these were early sketches working out how the pieces of cast iron uh, joined together um, and you know the importance of lugs and what these bolts look like and these were kind of all, already applied to the timber screen so the columns and the column bases acted as a, their own structure but the window surrounds um, were always bolted onto the timber screen so there was a 
importance to the timber screens. It did have um, some bracing um, qualities which were required. So obviously we'll be rebuilding the um, timber screens. And like I say, what, what, what we find in quite useful is there's so much documentation about the dismantling of the structure and that's helped us work out how the bits go back together. Um, and then if you go down you can see we've got um, photographs of what the minaret looked like at the top and, and this dismantling the cupola and um, also what the timber structure and supporting beams were. And, and through that we've kind of worked out how to upgrade the structure and also where we might put in new interventions. Now we haven't gone out the way to be able to design something which is in not in keeping. It's sympathetic, but it's a modern take of what would have been there in the first instance. It's not pastiche. Um, it's basically a quite a contemporary design, um, but a nod, always a nod to what what would have been there in the first instance in terms of what the seating might be like, what the flooring might be like careful detail in terms of um, lighting and heating um, and obviously these spaces were never heated so getting lighting and heating in were, are really important um, and that's how the briefs kind of developed um, and that's how, where we sort of we stand at this point in time um, where we have done a document which is a stage um, four report which is um, information to go out to tender and obviously the trust is hoping to raise enough funds to be able to go out to tender and get a preferred contractor on board and and realize um and release the potential of this building and get it built on site on the seafront yes. back where it should be not in a shed thank you Faye. that's absolutely fascinating and um it's it's great to to have seen so much planning going into how the restoration will happen um, and it's clear that the um, restored kiosk won't be a replica. It will be um, a, ki a kiosk from 1866, although yes. with um, any structure of that age, it needs a bit of additional support. So there's some assisted support. That's um, right. To, that's, um, a good, that's a good way of putting it, assisted support. <laughs> make yeah. sure it has a future life. Um, so that's great. Um, of course, one of our problems has been uh, this... Uh, pandemic and the way in which that's um, totally put out of um, out of um, sync any attempt to apply for the necessary levels of money from the heritage lottery fund but hopefully that process will start to come back uh, on stream quite soon um, but um, the Heritage Lottery Fund will only be one source of funding, there'll be other sources of funding and um, it's, uh, the Westbury Trust is, is reliant in many ways on donations from individuals and from other groups as well. Um, the Westbury Trust has its own website of course, most, uh, most people looking at this will have seen it, westbury.co.uk and there's a button there that if you want to donate we would be most most grateful but Faye I just wanted to thank you for, for your talk it's been absolutely great I've uh, each time I hear you talk I always learn something new oh, thank um, you, Fred. which so I feel as though my knowledge of the kiosk while it will never match yours is increasing all the time so Faye thank you very much thank indeed. you Thank you. And without people like the West Pier Trust as well, um, these buildings would be lost and people wouldn't be able to see them. So that's why it's important that people do donate and carry on funding and supporting the West Pier uh, Trust. It's important, not only for Brighton, but it, this, is a, this is a world import, important building. Um, and it's a real pleasure to work with both uh, you and Rachel and the West Pier Trust and with the building itself. So thank you very much. Thank you, Faye. Thank, Thank you. you.